My name is Robert Sidor. Um, joining me today is Andre Patanga, and um, uh, we get to work together on a, a quite a few different kind of uh, projects. One of which uh, most recently has been um, quite a bit of work around um, edge, uh, especially with um, RHEL. So with regards to topology, kind of jumping right in, a lot of times uh, what we're seeing is, is that uh, edge and edge discussions um, tend to be around extensions of the IT um, shop. And the IT organization is trying to figure out how to piece together their existing knowledge on Linux and what they're doing with Edge. And this oftentimes amounts to, um, you know, what they're familiar with. So racks, um, racks um, that bring compute closer to the Edge space where they're actually doing collection of data. And a lot of times this means um, OpenShift for Red Hat or um, uh, compute that is, uh, you know, extending what we're doing with a PaaS. But today we're gonna to actually talk about something that's actually further to the edge, which is smaller devices um, and bringing RHEL and Linux um, down to these edge devices. So next slide, please. Yeah, and I would add to Rob is that, you know, not too small devices, right? Because there's also edge deployments that are tiny sensors and, you know, spe very specialized hardware. What we're looking at today is a typical use case, which is more like edge servers, if I'm right, right, Rob? Mm -hmm. Exactly. So a little bit of housekeeping. We're not gonna talk about Aleph Edge um, today in particular, but I think that if you're watching this webinar, um, you should probably wanna look into um, Aleph Edge, Acrono and Edge Foundry. These are projects that um, the Linux Foundation and Red Hat are, are involved with. So um, think of LF Edge as really being kind of an umbrella that has a, a number of different organizations involved, and they're really creating a common framework for hardware and software standards. While projects like Acrono is really um, looking, you know, at a set of open infrastructure and blueprints for the edge. So I really, um, you know, would push you to really look into what those things are and, and how they're going to um, impact the industry. Let me second that. The stuff that's going on at LF Edge is super exciting. Uh, some of these solutions are getting to a great level of maturity. They're very comprehensive. If you want to take Rob and I's uh, presentation today, it's really about our learning process, right? We're two individual engineers that were exploring Edge and exploring really the building blocks of Edge, right? So as we're going to show, we're going to talk about image building, about updating the edge devices, sort of observability using open source components that are out there. But if you want to look at the state of the art and sort of the future, you know, and some of this really good stuff that's happening here, uh, you'd be remiss to not look at what's going on at lfedge.org. Great, thanks. And uh, so let's dive right into what we're going to really um, hone in on today, which is Linux at the edge, and, and specifically how we're working with RHEL at the edge. Um, this means that we have a number of different things that we have to think about from a management perspective. So um, how are we gonna actually build the code um, for Linux that's actually gonna be put out on the edge? Um, today, we're using a GitOps approach. We're also using Ansible in order to manage that. Um, and we're looking at Ansible from a couple of different um, uh, key vantage points. One is, do we have access on the network and is the network able to provide us um, with enough comfort where we can manage the edge devices with Ansible um, like we would other um, Linux instances? Or should we put Ansible down onto the edge and actually have it call back out? So basically it's a difference between a push and a pull model. And because of this, we're, you know, we've been looking at technologies like Ansible Runner, um, Ansible Builder um, and Reactor, uh, which kind of make Ansible really highly attractive for edge architectures. And then of course, the whole point of actually putting compute closer to the edge is to work with data, maybe reroute data, manipulate data, um, bring rules or AIML um, components down to the edge and how are we gonna run those? And we're gonna talk about Podman in that context today. So go ahead to the next slide. So another bit is um, from the configuration management, how are we gonna manage these images? We know that in the past when we had um, 
image management with uh, VMs, for instance. Um, we might have image sprawl, other things. So how can we manage these um, you know, as code? And can we put these in a GitOps kind of um, uh, fashion so that we can manage them with Git? And then in addition to that, can we manage them with um, novel things that we have, approaches that we have, such as um, OS Builder or RPM OS Tree, which we're also going to talk about today, so that we can reduce the network traffic, um, reduce the bandwidth requirements, um, because many of these edge use cases actually um, have a limited network, um, either um, bandwidth or uh, request latency. So, and then from the perspective of where are we going to design and build the applications, how are we going to um, manage the images that are going to be brought down and actually run, um, how are we going to actually build the edge images themselves for the OS, where are we going to collect telemetry, and how is that telemetry going to be brought back up from the edge. Uh, we're going to do that from our Kubernetes environment uh, in our example that we're going to talk about today. And next slide. And that brings us to um, uh, OpenShift, right? So OpenShift is Red Hat's Kubernetes. It's a fully um, uh, certified uh, Kubernetes platform that's all open source. We're running Ansible on top of Kubernetes. We're also running um, you know, the Elk stack on Kubernetes that's going to collect our telemetry information from Prometheus endpoints from those edge um, devices. Um, can we use smart management? So uh, what that is, is satellite, um, you know, formerly spacewalk, but now satellite. So are we going to add functionality so that if we are using an RPM approach versus an RPM OS tree approach, can we manage um, the OS and configuration? And then also um, leveraging, again, Ansible and uh, two different approaches in order to manage these um, actual devices. Yeah. And Thank you, Rob. We're going to start by taking a look at it, building these images. As Rob mentioned, uh, trying to define essentially a GitOps pipeline to create the images, sort of how these images are put together based on libOS3, RPM OS3. Um, you know, everything that you need to really create these images, create the image layers, put them out where the edge devices can get them, update them. Let's take a quick look at that. So the basis of it, right? Like if you look at an edge server image, uh, one of the key distinctions from a traditional, um, you know, rel operating system would be that we want to deliver that essentially as an image, almost like as an appliance, right? For a lot of reasons. So the basis of that is libos3. Uh, for those of you that may not know what that is, it's essentially a way to define um, OS file system trees, almost like Git right, where you can have layers and tag specific versions of layers on there. Um, the essence of it is becomes almost like um, an appliance deliverable that you can push out, as well as the updates, instead of being per RPM um, sort of updates, they are, you know, full on um, atomic updates, what you may call, and then has that has a lot of advantages for an edge um, standpoint. Um, because as we're going to see, one of the things is that we want to limit the downtime, limit, you know, maximize the uptime at those edge devices. So we're going to talk a little bit about how we do rollbacks into that and sort of health checks. You know, it's either all in, either all the update succeeds or it kind of rolls back. So, but the basis of it is that take a look at RPM OS3 and libOS3 and start thinking about how you know sort of these um, um, complete file system trees can be delivered to the edge device, as well as how that simplifies the update process. So to take a quick look at RPM OS tree and how that works on RHEL for the edge, but in general as well, um, the idea is that it becomes an immutable um, image, right? Mostly read only. Uh, we still have state maintained under VAR and Etsy. Uh, and the essence of it is that there's no in between states between, you know, in between state between the updates, right? It's not like I'm just adding an RPM here or modifying this or that there. Everything gets defined as a Git, uh, you know, uh, file, right? Everything gets defined as code, as text, you know, configuration files. And then these images are, are created, layers as it gets updated, and then that gets pushed out to, to the edge device. 
and it gets staged there, right? Um, as the updates are coming out and pushed to the mirrors, but then they only, they get updated. The system gets updated when you reboot, right? So you, re you schedule that reboot at a specific time. And then when it reboots, it boots into this new partition and then um, it succeeds or rolls back and we have green boot, which is a method to um, take a look at if it was successful and roll back. So the basis of it is, you know, you may ask, but how do I build these, um, you know, RPM OS3 images, right? And, um, you know, we encourage everybody to check out the open source OS build project, specifically Composer, right? So Composer is a really great tool the idea with Composer is that you define what goes into your image as a text human readable file. And then Composer has a process that generates these um, OS tree um, artifacts for you. Not only OS tree, it does other types of images as well. But for the purposes of this presentation, we're going to focus on OS tree. So the idea here, you can see it's pretty easy to read and understand. It's just a text file that gets committed to your GitHub repo, right? So your SCM repo. And, you know, for example, you can add specific packages. Uh, in our case, as Rob was saying earlier, our applications are gonna be delivered as containers. So we're using Podman as the container tool for that, right? So in our case, we would add, you know, Podman and the specific version that we want there. Um, this is what's called the blueprint. And then once you have the, you know, you have your blueprint in Git, um, you know, it creates an artifact, but how do you actually, you know, boot into that artifact, into that file system tree, right? How do you actually, uh, you know, provision that system? And the way that we use, you know, to Rob's point um, before, using traditional skill sets that you may have today in the traditional data center, we're just using a kickstart file, right? Here's a typical kickstart file. And the only difference is that I'm, you know, kind of mounting an OS tree here. Um, and it's picking that up from an HTTP location, right? So remember before we said that these are immutable images, right? Layer, Git-like in their characteristics. I'm creating those by defining a blueprint in Composer. And then once those get created, I just put them in an HTTP location. And then my system, you know, my edge server can pick up that from, can pick that image up from HTTP and boot it. Uh, so right now we have basically three artifacts that I talked about so far, right? We have my blueprint for Composer, which is a text file. We have my Kickstarter file, which is just a text file. And we have the actual RPM OS tree file system tree. And one important thing is that the good thing about using Kickstart is that you can have a pre and post section like you had traditionally in Kickstart. So if you want to drop in certain configurations or certain things that are specific for your use case, you can do that as well. Um, we actually provide, you know, uh, Image Builder is sort of uh, the Red Hat product around it. Uh, the cool thing about it is that you can do it through the command line in a Git like way like we you know like we're going to describe in this presentation but um if you're a red hat customer you can take a look at uh having a gui for it using the cockpit administration program and uh, as you can see here you can even refer to a previous commit right so you're just kind of layering that file system as changes come in and this is shipped and supported by red hat as a commercial product so overall, taking all of these elements that I described so far, right, let's quickly take a look at this pipeline. As um, uh, Rob mentioned, basically we have the southbound here, which is my, my edge nodes, and the northbound, which is all running in Kubernetes, and it's my image build pipeline, right? So imagine that this is a Kubernetes cluster, right, OpenShift, et cetera. Uh, Tecton is the CI CD uh, pipeline behind it. So Here's my Git repo, right? My SCM. What do I have there? I have my text blueprint, very simple, right? How I compose my image. I have my kickstart file, which is everything that I need to actually do the deployment of that image. So as I'm as an operator, as I'm making changes to my my uh, my code here, 
right? It kicks the, the pipeline. Uh, it automatically, you know, what we do is we launch a VM, right? Uh, you know, we don't want to have like a static image builder, right? Our infrastructure there. So what we do, we sort of dynamically create a system, a RHEL system, right? An OS build system that's going to actually do that composing that I described earlier you, using our blueprint. And as Rob mentioned earlier before, we're just using, you know, like that composer process. It's just really creating, you know, a, a file system tree based on RPM packages. These could be Red Hat RPM packages or third party RPM packages that you may have your software shipped as. Then we download the sort of the image artifacts, archive the previous image artifacts to, uh, artifact to Nexus. And then we publish, you know, basically that RPM OS3 artifact is a tarball. Um, we upload that to our HTTP location and then have a similar pipeline to the Kickstart file, right? As we made any changes to our Kickstart or not, right? It templates out that Kickstart file for me, archives the previous version and publishes the, our Kickstart here to my HTTP location. And the cool thing about this is that um, it doesn't have to be like a single location where I'm going to have 2,500, 10,000 edge nodes getting there. These could be distributed regionally, right? I mean, it's really as simple as an S3 bucket or whatever other HTTP location that you have here. Uh, so it's it's pretty economical and, you know, it can be geo geo distributed fairly easy. And that's all that you need to to get your 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 um, uh, edge node to boot, and the actual boot process can be done through Pixie Boot, right? Just you know, you imagine that I just brought in that device to the edge, I light it up, it's set to you know Pixie Boot, it Pixie Boots picks up the um, Kickstart file and the image artifact, and then it fully builds itself with the latest version. And to that point, there's the idea of over the air updates, right? And some of the advantages of that. As we know, edge servers, edge locations may have intermittent or disconnected bandwidth. Normally, you know, we want some kind of lightweight way to do that. So we only transfer that those delta layers from the image, right? Remember that I was saying that as we're updating that image, we stage that, we stage those images locally at the edge device and then reboot into it. Well, we don't want to have to download a full, you know, gigabyte image every time there's an update. So this is a graph that shows that, right? Here I have, um, you know, a couple of nodes. This one, the blue guy here has this version. So it only needs this revision three layer on top of it. Whereas a new build that doesn't have anything will get the full image. Any comments you want to make so far, Rob? I'm going pretty fast. Yeah, I think, you know, with, with RHEL 8.3, um, what we've, you know, we have the new image um, capabilities with, you know, admins can now stage their updates so they can consume less data and apply the updates on the reboot, like you just said. But what that also means is that I can choose the best time for a maintenance window and apply the updates um, on my terms, you know, something that maximizes, you know, uptime. So, um, some things that we've considered are like using um, uh, performance copilot or PCP in order to check um, bandwidth um, on the network for these low bandwidth or intermittent, um, uh, you know, intermittently connected devices, and then choosing when, based on those um, uh, on that data and telemetry, um, when to actually push the updates and stage the updates. Right. So um, this gives us a little more control over how we're managing the edge devices. It does. And, and another thing that's cool about it as well, and we're going to get into more details about this in a second, the edge nodes have the ability to kind of once every 24 hours or however frequency you want, check the, up to check the update mirrors to see if there's new layers to the image, right? So and, and sort of initiate a download and a pool of that, of that um, you know, layer. So the cool thing about it is that it's firewall friendly as well. We're not necessarily pushing it to the edge device, which would be difficult and error prone. We're actually, you know, per, just updating the, the mirrors using the pipeline that I showed earlier. And then the edge devices can check them every 24 hours and download and stage whatever is necessary. 
And uh, what we want, and yeah, actually uh, that's exactly what I was describing here. It's a simple conf file that you would change. You know, your update policy can be to stage as I was describing, or it can also be to update as soon as there is an update, you know, depending on how you prefer to. It's just HTTP traffic, right? And the cool thing is, as I mentioned, you can stage those updates at a local regional center, or even, you know, if you have a rack of edge servers, you know, maybe in that rack. And, you know, if you have any questions so far, please put them in the QA, uh, moving fairly fast. Um, some of this may be new to you all. So just hit us with questions, no problem. And finally, this is the last part of what I was describing earlier, right? You know, we want to have this image-based deployable uh, to our edge devices, right? We want to be able to layer the updates via images, and we want to boot into that to Rob's point whenever is the proper outage window that I have there. And what I want is I don't want uncertainty and risk, right? Because if that update fails, I can't really go to that edge device and kind of touch it and kind of fix it manually, right? That's completely prohibitive. So the idea is that because I have these atomic images, right, these full images, what I'm gonna do is boot into that one, right? So here's, for example, on this version of the image, right? And I do the updates by rebooting and I boot into that second version of the image, right? And then what we do is we do a health check, right? There is a, you know, a arbitrary script that can actually test your application, right? Not just the health of the update process itself, but seeing if like, hey, after this image was updated, is my DNS server still responding or, you know, whatever is the workload that's running on that edge node, is it still functioning? And if it is, then okay, then I carry on, you know, and keep, keep going that way. But if not, I can trigger an automatically, an automatic um, recovery routine. That brings me back to the previous known and trusted image. So, so think of it this way, um, you know, on boot up system D would run, um, some check services that are kind of grouped together under like a health target. And if the targets reached, um, you know, the status basically, you know, success or failure would help us determine what to do. So if we rebooted and we had just done an RPM OS tree update um, and something, you know, uh, failed, we could have it say, you know, RPM dash OS tree rollback on reboot for the failure. Or we could say um, retry um, and see if, if that fixes it. In either event, the, the goal here is to make it so that um, if there's a failure, we can put it back into a previously known good state, right? And your edge device isn't going to be taken offline just because of a failure on an update. Well said. So yeah. think of it uh, like a generic health check framework for system D. I think uh, that would be. Yep, and, and that concludes the image and update section of, of the presentation. So please post any questions you have uh, so far. You know, again, the idea is that we're not using a traditional Linux image for this, right? We're using, you know, RPM OS tree, lib OS tree to create essentially um, a fully deployable appliance, right? Which is a file system image, which is version and layered. We can create these using a pipeline, a GitOps pipeline. Uh, we can update those uh, by just, you know, committing code to Git. Um, and then finally, we can distribute those and pull them, update them, health check them, and et cetera. So the idea with this is that we're trying to solve the image builds, the image deployment, and the image update process. Yeah, and again, and one, go ahead. Uh, and, uh, and, and another part there is, you know, we're, we're also trying to optimize um, the network for these edge devices, recognizing that many, um, many locations have uh, network bandwidth or, you know, uh, semi or, or uh, sometimes disconnected issues. So um, we're looking at, um, you know, how can we stage those updates? Um, can we create convenience maintenance windows um, to do those updates? Can we roll back to a prior known image, you know, if a failure happens? So, um, and um, one thing I have to add, Andre, is, is that we're talking specifically about edge here, 
with regard to RHEL, but all these features also exist with the ability to compose images for RHEL, not just RHEL for Edge. That's true. That's true. And one last comment is that again, LF Edge or you know initiative, this is not the only way to do this, right? There's um, complete solutions around it by the LF organization and initiative umbrella. This is really a learning process that Rob and I went through, right? To understand the individual components of the edge solution. So let's take a quick run through to logging metrics and observability, right? So now I got my edge nodes deployed. Um, you know, how can I know that, they, how do I know if they're up? You know, how does, you know, observability, measurability, um, these elements come together. So what, you know, again, this has been a learning process, right? So the idea is that we're trying to figure out uh, on the edge device, we need to have OS metrics, right? We need to understand, you know, how my performance is going from an OS perspective. And as um, Rob was saying, even things like, you know, network performance, bandwidth, you know, how tied up I am for system resources. So that's the first type of metrics that we wanted to get. But very importantly, as we're deploying these application workloads as containers, we need to have pretty in-depth knowledge about the applications themselves. So the way that, that we solve this in our demo and in our in, in, you know, test environment has been by using performance copilot, you know, PCP for the OS metrics. And we're gonna explain why we chose that in a second and using Prometheus to get application level metrics. Uh, so basically we're running PCP performance copilot as a container, running the apps as a container, the apps are instrumented to provide slash metrics and P, uh, uh, performance copilot is also providing slash metrics OS data. We aggregate, one of the challenges that we had is that this could be a lot of different apps, a lot of different metrics, and we don't want Prometheus to have a ton of endpoints to mine per edge device, right? We wanted to present a single edge device. And that's where performance copilot really worked for us. Uh, we were able to kind of aggregate all the app data and all the OS metrics as a single Prometheus endpoint by using performance copilot, which can expose you know, the metrics that it gets from all of these locations as an open metrics Prometheus slash metrics. So me as a system administrator, right, as an operator, I can have a custom dashboard in Grafana running on Kubernetes on OpenShift, right? That's consuming that Prometheus um, time series data. This can be persisted so I can do retroactive analysis as well. A quick run through performance copilot for, you know, we want this talk to be accessible to everyone, not assuming any previous knowledge. So performance copilot is a great way. It has these agents, a ton of different agents, right? Uh, and the cool thing why we selected it for this project one is because as I mentioned, you could aggregate all of these different endpoints and expose these metrics as Prometheus time series data, but also because it's lightweight, right? We've done uh, tests on very lightweight deployments, minimum bandwidth, um, you know, and these agents are fantastic. They're mostly written in C um, and they give great performance for the amount and the richness of the data that they provide. So basically PMCD in our, event, in our example is running as a container on the edge device, which is here on the left. And then it provides this endpoint in our case to Prometheus, but you can also kind of, as an, as an administrator, use some of these other um, tools to chart, log, and manipulate this data in various ways. And here's a little bit more. Um, this is a great, I, I just wanted to give a shout out to the folks that created the PMDA for Prometheus, right? Which allows us essentially to pick up a Prometheus endpoint metric uh, from anywhere, right? From all our applications, very simple config, very, you know, we want this to be easy to maintain and understand, you know, as newcomers to the edge space. And this offered all of that. We can capture OS metrics application metrics um, in a single sort of fabric. And then Prometheus is highly scalable, right? So you can have a distributed kind of, depending on how many edge nodes you have, you can have um, a federated sort of Prometheus setup or it scales sufficiently well that in our test environment, 
we have 2,500 um, edge nodes and, and it was sufficient to have one Prometheus endpoint. So let, let me uh, add on to that for a second. Sure. So think of it this way, you know, when we push things down to the edge, what we're really looking for is telemetry information from the operating system. The thing that's gonna run um, either a container or the application, right? So in our, in our instance, we're gonna talk about Podman in a, in a minute um, and we're running containers within Podman and then the actual application itself. All those things would ha normally have Prometheus endpoints and they do. Um, so we can have a Prometheus exporter in our application that's running in the container, but just because the application's up and running, you know, uh, um, you know, if the if the container's up and running, is the application running? Is Podman working correctly? Did we reboot? What's going on with the operating system? So we have all these Prometheus endpoints. If we were to expose all those, like you normally would in a Kubernetes environment, um, anybody who's running Kubernetes knows that you have multiple, you know, multitudes of Prometheus endpoints that are being scraped um, and collecting telemetry data within your cluster. But from an edge perspective, um, we don't necessarily want to uh, call in and scrape multiple Prometheus endpoints from multiple deployed applications that are uh, running on that edge device. So we, knowing that we have all these Prometheus endpoints, could we bundle them all up using PCP and expose them to the outside world as a single Prometheus endpoint, scrape all that data, maybe even limit that data. So in an example that um, Andre and I um, have, we cut down the data by like 98%. Um, so what does this mean? An, a Prometheus endpoint is an HTTP endpoint. That's expensive operation if we had multiples of those. So what we want is um, hit the Prometheus endpoint, one Prometheus endpoint, scrape that data for that entire stack of stuff, bring back it absolutely what's necessary. So maybe some of that data is going to the NOC. Maybe some of that data is going to go back um, and help us make uh, deterministic um, uh, approaches to how we're going to download and update maybe the application or maybe push the um, application, uh, maybe the OS update um, from Ansible. So we're going to use that data for different reasons. So we want to be able to filter that data and make it as small as possible often, uh, uh, oftentimes because of network issues. Um, and we want to limit the network bandwidth and, and the amount of data that's going back and forth. So PCP and what Andre is talking about with that PMDA, um, helping us expose that single, um, you know, uh, uh, Prometheus endpoint is an important thing to consider depending upon how you're viewing the edge. Is it in the data center? Is it really a remote device someplace? Um, do I have network uh, bandwidth considerations? Um, you know, so you have to take all that into account when when looking at these different kinds of approaches. I, I think what we're showing here is actually all supportable right out of the box with RHEL today. Um, so we didn't implement anything that wasn't, uh, you know, it, it's all open source, but it's all also supportable. Yep. If you're a Red Hat customer and you have RHEL in your environment, you can play with all of these elements that we describe here today. One last thing I wanted to say this before we move on to the next section of the presentation is that another reason why we chose PCP, which is a really cool reason, is that they have this awesome PMDA, you know, like this performance uh, agent, collecting agent for BCC, right, which taps into BPF. <clears throat> Needless to say, if you're talking observability and, you know, in general, getting uh, metrics in a lightweight and powerful metrics that you couldn't get before, BPF is making, you know, a huge impact in the industry. And, you know, when we're talking about collecting OS metrics, we can even collect BPF metrics through BPC, through uh, BCC and into, P into the PC PCP PMDA. So this is another great reason. And um, um, Rob was mentioning the performance uh, inference engine. This is another thing that's really, really cool. Uh, the, P the Performance Copilot project has this um, sub feature called uh, the inference engine, which can, you know, make intelligence, you know, can make choices and trigger actions depending on certain thresholds and et cetera, or even complex conditions of metrics. So you could potentially 
trigger a podman run to re-download a container or an Ansible run to you know fire off an alert or something like that. This summarizes a little bit everything that we talked about, the scalable backend services in Kubernetes, picking up data as a single endpoint from each one of the edge devices. And we chose these, um, um, you know, chose the stack because it's simple, because it ships in RHEL, it's widely available, everybody understands it. You know, again, the idea of skills and keeping your skill set simple. So now let's turn over our attention really quickly to the last part of the presentation. We talked about image management and updates. We talked about observability and, and sort of uh, measurability. And now let's take a look at application management. So with Podman, um, really, we need a way to run applications that we're actually delivering down to the edge. Um, now at Red Hat, you know, we use Podman. Uh, so I know uh, many people are probably, um, uh, you know, used to consuming Docker. Think of Podman. Um, it's, you know, it's an OCI compliant um, uh, container engine. You know, think of it that way. Um, it's very, it's highly compatible, if not fully compatible with a Docker API, but there's some major differences. So Docker runs kind of in a client server architecture and Podman runs in a daemonless architecture. Um, so when working with Docker, we have to consume the CLI that communicates with a backend daemon. Um, the main logic actually resides in the daemon under Docker and um, that builds the images, executes containers, um, and that requires that the daemon have root privileges. Podman architecture really allows us to run um, containers under the user that started the container. So when you think of like a fork exec and that that user does not need to have root privileges so I can run rootless containers. The other advantage here is, is that um, basically no user can see any other users um, running container images, right? So because I'm, I'm running in that daemon uh, in that uh, um, uh, rootless um, condition. So mm -hmm. because Podman is uh, daemonless, um, each user can only see and modify their own containers. Think of it that way. Mm -hmm. um, and there's no common daemon, you know, for the CLI tool to really, you know, talk to. Um, so think of it that way. Um, when you have, we have additional tooling built around that. So if I want to, um, unlike Docker, if I want to have more fine grained control over how I layer container images, um, I would also add that uh, we use a tool called Builda. Uh, yes, it has a, uh, Dan Walsh is the uh, uh, person here at Red Hat who helped uh, create these projects and he's from Boston. So we put an AH on a lot of, uh, at the end of a lot of these words. So um, I have to call out that, you know, Dan is really responsible for a lot of this and um, has done a fantastic job, you know, with Podman and, and helping us um, create these tools. Um, Scopio, so how could I move an image securely from one registry to another registry? So Scopio is another another tool that we use. This so, one is cool too, yeah. Yeah, go ahead, Andre, if you want to talk about it. No, 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 you, you get started. I'll, I'll add some color. <laughs> so um, think of it as, um, you know, we want to look for uh, whether or not we have an update label and can we actually pull, uh, create a policy that actually pulls and does an update um, of an image and runs it within Podman. So, um, this is a little um, different than maybe what you're used to working with in Docker, but it adds um, a lot of capability if we want to keep things up to date. Yeah, it, it's similar to that idea that we had for the image, the OS image itself, right? The idea is that we only have these layers and they get pulled down, um, you know, in an automated fashion, you know, rather than pushed to the edge device. The same idea here, right? This is sort of like, you know, uh, sort of as autonomous as possible, right? Where we have the up OS continually updated, but we also have the application workload continually updated, right? Podman is checking, you know, nightly to make sure, you know, at the local registry, as Rob mentioned, we have the tools to kind of man to manage the distribution of those images to those, you know, regional registries, and then, um, you know, automatically update itself based on policy as new versions of the workload get deployed. 
So uh, you'll notice that we have, we say, you know, as a system D unit here, because Podman is daemonless, we can communicate with system D and the combination of system D and Podman can make sure that our application is continually up and running. In a lot of scenarios, um, we're building the images on a Kubernetes platform and we're doing all our great development in a PaaS environment. In some cases, we're looking at, you know, putting a Kubernetes um, at the edge, but that requires a lot of resources versus some of the um, solutions that we're looking at uh, require, you know, a lot less resources. We have, you know, eight gigs of RAM is a high end and, you know, two, um, two core processor. We have to run a bunch of applications. Um, so what do we really want to do? We want to run the application. We don't need to schedule the application. We don't need to move it from host uh, to host. We don't need to um, do a bunch of things that Kubernetes necessarily um, provides, but we still want the advantage of running applications in containers. So the, from the development aspect all the way down to the deployment and using the registry and everything else, um, so Podman fits a really cool niche because we can run it as a pod and run that container in a pod and do some of those um, cool design patterns. But really, um, for many edge applications, the application just needs to be up and running. And if it fails, it needs to restart. And so System D, in combination with Podman, is a perfect fit for that. Well said. And of course, where do these images come from? So a lot of times people start off with their container development and they might go to Docker Hub and I'm not saying anything uh, negative about anybody's, um, you know, where they're storing the images, but what you want is something that you, uh, a trusted source for your images, right? So whether you're, if you tried to create your own images, you know that that's a complex task. Uh, so creating a base image. So um, what we provide is a universal base image that you can start from. Uh, think of it as like small, medium, and large, you know, does it require system D? Should it use, um, you know, uh, um, is there, uh, you know, an RPM update, you know, like DNF kind of capability in it? How fat do you want that base image? Can we start off with something that is um, securely, uh, securely created, scanned regularly? Um, if there is an update to that image, can we pull the update to that image and have it update all of our images, you know, um, from the base image. Um, and so what Red Hat has created is what's called the, a UBI or universal base image. Um, and these are, if you go to um, uh, the catalog.redhat.com or um, registry.redhat.io, um, what you'll find is if you do a search there on UBI, um, you'll find a number of different kinds of uh, base images that you can choose from. You can use these whether or not you're a Red Hat customer or not. You'll get support if you're, uh, you know, obviously a Red Hat customer. But I would encourage you um, to be very careful with uh, how you're choosing your base images. Many of them are unsecure. They have root access. Um, if you're running them in Docker, you could get um, uh, contamination from one container to another, um, maybe exposing yourself to security issues. Um, definitely look at your um, container image pipeline. And how are you scanning that and, and adding to those images when you add the applications to those images and layer things in? Um, always start with something from a known trusted source, um, whether that's from uh, Red Hat or some other source, or you created it yourself. Yep, as we're deploying these applications to Podman at the edge, have a really good, secure, trusted, universal base image, right? So you don't end up with like a very heterogeneous environment, right? A lot of what we're trying to do at the edge is have things look and be the same, right? We're creating this image-based deployment. So every, you know, all the devices are at the same level at the OS. We're creating Podman across the board. Now we're deploying these applications. We don't want to have all of these different, um, you know, versions of uh, versions and in um, releases of packages, right? So whether or not you're a Red Hat customer, universal base image, runs everywhere, use it. It's a good way to start and standardize across your edge deployment. Um, one last thing there is if if you've used uh, Red Hat images in the past, um, they used to require a, uh, you know, a subscription manager on the underlying node in order for you to, to use them. Um, so 
uh, universal base image or, or the UBI eight images don't require that. So um, I would suggest, you know, go give it a try, uh, give it a look. Um, if you already have Docker files and you're pulling the image from someplace and you see that there's a, a, a UBI image, experiment with it, pull it down, you know, um, you'll probably see that there's different kinds, um, minimal footprint, uh, larger footprint, depending on the needs that you have. That brings us essentially to the end. I hope you've been posting questions to the chat. We're going to have a little bit of time for Q&A. Uh, but before we go, we wanted to leave you to a couple of things. LF Edge, I'm going to say one more time, incredible work that's being done by the community, sponsored by the Linux Foundation and an umbrella of incredibly smart people. You know, again, our presentation really was our learning process as individuals and looking at the building blocks of an edge solution in terms of image, container, and et cetera. What these folks have done is bring very complex and mature and very powerful solutions for a number of different dimensions of the edge um, challenge. So please go there and check this out. And a few more resources, Rob, you want to take us through these resources really quickly? Sure. I think um, so. Ben Briard, who's listed there as the first, these are all videos on YouTube already existing. Um, ben Briard, we work with regularly with uh, the RHEL Edge team. Um, in addition to that, there's really these seven great um, videos that are here uh, walking you through specifically how to create um, images install the images uh, and then deploy them doing all the things that we talked about today. So um, each one of these videos is probably less than 15 minutes. Um, the material is really good. I, I would suggest, uh, you know, starting there and you could do that with, you know, uh, in a VM on your own machine um, and mm -hmm. get started today. That's true. Whether or not you're a Red Hat customer, you know, you have like a Red Hat account as a, you can get a Red Hat developer account, you know, which is free and essentially build everything that we just talked about. And some of these videos are gonna walk through that process. Um, I think we have one question in QA. Let me see, three questions in QA. You said it will boot into Pixie and update. What will it boot into? What server configuration is required for this? What edge node preparation is required that it gets into Pixie versus the installed OS? Great question. So it's really, really simple, right? Imagine this, right? We talked about earlier that these are edge servers that are going into a small closet somewhere in a manufacturing facility, right? Uh, I'm basically, I have a new factory that I want to enable with this solution, right? So basically I have, let's say, you know, a couple of devices, right? That are, you know, pre-configured for me. All I would do is on the BIOS, of that uh, device, right? That physical device that I'm delivering to the factory, I would set it to boot in the BIOS, not to the hard disk, <clears throat> but boot to a Pixie boot, right? And then within that, you know, environment, I have a D DHCP server that's pointing me to, you know, within that network, right? That that I'm a part of, that this device is plugging into. There's a DHCP server that has a boot server record, right? That points me to essentially that Pixie boot uh, path, right? Then in that, it downloads automatically the um, kickstart, right? From my HTTP location, that kickstart points to where the image is. The image gets downloaded and then laid down on the operating system. And, um, you know, there you go to, to all intents and purposes. Uh, what you know, one one thing to add there, um, Andre, is is that the initial image may be larger, um, but the subsequent images, if you're using RPM OS tree, are actually deltas, so they're they're much smaller um, than you know when you're doing traditional RPM updates. That's right, and 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 your Pixie boot configuration too. What you can do is that you know uh, the first time that you boot the server, this is an important part that I I would be remiss to mention to the person that asked, you know, my network server, my DHCP server is pointing at my Pixie boot server, right? My Pixie boot server gives me the kickstarts and gives me the image. I boot into it. It gets installed into the, uh, into the hard disk, right, of my device. And then I boot into that, right? Then what I do in my, my Pixie boot server is that 
once I boot it once, now the next time it's going to tell me to boot from my hard disk, not from Pixie. Uh, this is something that Red Hat supports out of the box in our Pixie boot server. Uh, and then the next time that I boot, I'm going to build into my, my, uh, op, my hard disk. And as Rob said, I can get the new version of the image if there's one and boot there. So the business value of that to the person that asked the question and to everybody else, this is a really cool part of the solution, right? Is that I really don't have to do anything to these physical devices before I deploy them to the edge site, right? Literally nothing. Just when I buy those devices from Dell, from HP or from micro, you know, from wherever, right? All I just ask when, you know, by my OEM is that, you know, the BIOS be configured to boot from, you know, the network on the, my first time, you know, and, and then on my network for that location where I'm deploying that physical device, I configure the HCP to point to a Pixie boot server, you know, that's really all it is, you know, so all the configuration just happens at the network for that area. And there's nothing special that I need to boot. I can bring one device, two devices, and importantly, from a skill standpoint, the person that's deploying these uh, edge devices doesn't have to do anything about Linux, right? Doesn't have to be uh, a deeply skilled uh, engineered engineer, right? They're just literally putting that box there, plugging into the network and booting. And every other aspect of what we said is more or less like this, right? These images are, you know, updated in an automatic fashion. Uh, Podman and the container image are getting auto, uh, updated in an automatic fashion. So from the day one, when I, I'm first deploying that, you know, edge server to my factory, in my example, to forever, I, I never really have to touch it, you know what I mean? Unless something disastrous goes wrong with my, you know, hardware. Uh, but in that case, I would just take a new piece of hardware and plug in where that other one was. Uh, let me see if we have more questions. Can you post it on the chat window? I, I just responded there, Andre, that um, everyone will get a PDF of the Prezo and that has the links in it. Okay, I see some of the questions have been responded already. I think we're doing on time. We're good. I think we, we kind of did. We hit it. Fellas, everybody who stayed on to the end, we really appreciate it. Massive respect to all of you for learning and, and kind of teaching yourself and coming with us in our learning journey. This is what Rob and I have been doing for the past few months. Don't forget to go to LF Edge. Rob, any final words from your side? No, I'm just responding to uh, someone who's asking uh, another question here. Oh, but thank you question. very much for joining us today. And we really appreciate um, any feedback that you have. Yeah. Wonderful. Okay, thank you so much, Andre and Robert, both of you for being here and leading us through this discussion today. And thank you for everybody who participated. Um, as a quick reminder, the recording will be on the Linux Foundation YouTube page later today. Um, and unless you guys have anything else to add, I think that um, you're good. Yeah, feel free to email me and Rob with, you know, if you wanna follow up. Um, if this is something your company might be interested in, as we mentioned, uh, Red Hat can help you with that. Uh, or if you just want to talk about the open source components, we're open to that conversation as well. Okay, Thank wonderful. Thank you so much again, everyone.